Montgomery Community Media presents Small Business Network, brought to you by M&T Bank. SBN is also sponsored by Montgomery County Economic Development Corporation and Leadership Montgomery. Hello and welcome to M&T Bank's Small Business Network. My name is Kelly Leonard. Every month we bring the business community together to network, to collaborate, and to share best practices in an effort to stimulate regional economic development. Today, the topic is how to accelerate small business through mergers and acquisition. And I'm joined by this distinguished panel of guests. And before we get started with the questions, I just want to give our audience and the folks here in the studio an idea of who you folks are. So first up is William, a.k.a. Billy Duffy. He's the vice president with um, M&T Investment Banking Group. He's responsible for advising clients in the areas of mergers and acquisitions, private placements, and corporate finance matters. Then we have Will Ferguson. Prior to joining the Baltimore Washington Business Brokers, LLC, <laughs> Will worked in an array of industries handling multi-million dollar transactions in the equipment leasing business. His focus is to help clients create business and investment-based wealth. Finally, CEO of Beyond, Lori Wiggins, provides business executives and owners assistance to plan and execute a successful buy or sell transaction. She assists business owners to improve strategy and business value. She helps buyers avoid acquiring hidden liabilities and overpaying, and she also helps sellers to achieve maximum valuation. So welcome. Thank Thanks you. for joining Thank us. Thank you. Now, before we get started, because we throw around this word small business, and we all kind of think that we're talking the same language, but we're not. And so what I'd like to do to set the stage is get a better sense of how you all are defining, when we talk about small business and mergers and acquisition, how are you all defining a small business? Is it EBITDA? Is it revenue-based? So explain that to us. Sure. So um, this is an interesting question because ultimately um, there's no concrete guidance out in the market. In my definition, uh, within M&T's corporate investment banking group, specifically uh, actually our corporate investment banking group, is going to be very different from our small business bankers that are inside of M&T. And my definition will be different from Will's and Laurie's. But ultimately, our group views um, a small business as those that generate or call it less than three million dollars in EBITDA on an annual basis which generally translates to call it around 20 million dollars in revenue so we generally work with companies that are generating over three million dollars in EBITDA on an annual basis from time to time we'll work with smaller companies that are executing on a proven growth strategy and will be achieving that $3 million threshold in the very near future. Okay, Will, how about you? How are you defining it? Well, we focus on trades and uh, Main Street businesses. So we look at uh, everything from startup to about $20 million, okay. small M&A. Mm -hmm. Lori, how about you? So sole proprietorships are usually a million or less in annual revenue. Small businesses, one to 10 million. Mid market is above 10 million to about 250 million. And our strength is helping people buy and sell digital businesses across these market segments. Okay. And so even when I think of the topic of mergers and acquisitions, naturally I don't think of small business. And I don't know if a lot of people are kind of in the same boat that I am, you're thinking ExxonMobil, like the big guys, right? right, right. You're not thinking of you know, family business LLC on Main Street. And so Lori, specific to you, what are the advantages of a small business to engage in a merger or acquisition? It's a great question. Well, it's the same advantages that big businesses enjoy, and that is you grow your business faster. There's two ways to grow a business, organically or inorganically. If you're growing your business organically, you just keep doing the same thing that you're doing today. Inorganic growth involves acquisition, and studies show that companies that engage in acquisition grow faster than their organic competition. You grow your customer base faster, thus your revenue base. You can enhance your offerings so that 
you offer better products to your current and future clients. Also, your employees enjoy being part of a fast-growing company, so that helps you with motivation and retention. Okay, awesome. And Billy, um, so what type of help, if I'm thinking that, oh, you know, I want to consider um, a merger or acquisition, what kind of help do you think I would need in order to successfully either sell or acquire? Sure, that's, a, that's another great question. So there are a few key partners that you should utilize in an acquisition. Um, the first is a banker or a broker. Um, <coughs> depending on the size of the business and the profitability of the business, it may not make sense to use a traditional banker who generally is more expensive than a broker. Um, but thankfully out there, there are a ton of good brokers like Will here who can assist you on um, a transaction that lends itself more so to a broker. A broker transaction is um, generally a smaller, less complex deal that often trades, I would say, and feel free to chime in here after me, regionally or locally, whereas a banker transaction is one that will require more structure, it's more complex, and ultimately it's, it usually ends up in a broad auction that includes national and international buyers. Um, as a banker, we would come in and we would help dimension the business, and what I mean by that is we would highlight your key investment considerations, really reinforce your growth strategies, do some pro forma analysis, including um, understanding the true operating aspects of the business and show normal course operating cash flows. Um, we would manage the outreach process to the buyers. We would uh, we assist in um, getting bids in, structuring the bids, evaluating the bids, and ultimately in um, helping the company go through the due diligence phase. The next key advisor that's very important is a, is a lawyer. And you don't want just a corporate lawyer. You want a transaction attorney, mm -hmm. somebody that is focused on deals. And that lawyer will assist you in negotiating an asset purchase agreement or a stock purchase agreement, depending upon the structure of the deal. And the key here is to mitigating uh, post-deal uh, liability and risk, mm -hmm. which Laurie mentioned earlier. And finally, um, you want a strong accountant. Ultimately, the accountant is going to help you come, is going to help structure things from a tax, tax perspective. Mm -hmm. um, it, ideally, you, know, you can also have somebody like Laurie come in on the front end and help position the company and get the company in good order to go to market. So you mentioned a banker, broker, attorney, and accountant, all of whom sound rather expensive. So what, what would a per like what could you expect to invest, um, or what would the cost be of pursuing an acquisition sure. or a merger? And I know it's probably it differs depending on the deal, sure. but I, I'm just curious. So it, it, you brought up a big point. There's, there's no real answer that I can tell you. It really differs on the deal. We've had, uh, we've had deals where we've seen legal fees at $200,000. we have seen legal fees at $400,000, half a million dollars. Mm -hmm. um, the accountants are usually, you know, call it fifty to 100000 um, bucks, And, you know, a banker is going to be paid a fee of sometimes one, one and a half percent on a deal, if not, you know, subject to a minimum fee as well. Mm -hmm. But that's probably, those figures probably sound scary, um, but those fees, I'm throwing fees out that are generally used in, say, a transaction that's going around 50 to 70 million dollars okay. or so. So, uh, Will probably has better insight than I would on the, the smaller size and uh, in the fees in, in that arena. Sorry to put you on the spot. No, that's fine. I think when you're looking when you're looking at the smaller size entities, you're looking somewhere in the range of six to about 15 percent okay. total investment, total cost, what you're going to spend for the transaction. So we forgot about the insurance agent. Mm. And a lot of times these, these partners are already there. Mm -hmm. They're just not playing an active role. And what has to happen is you have to get them to switch their thinking from now maintaining your business to what is it that we need to do to sell this business. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's some lapses in insurance coverage. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's some things that we need to do from an accounting standpoint. 
Um, so that's the that's the thought process. But you're looking in that range as far as an expense for what we would call small business. Uh, fundamentally, that's probably about ten million or less. Okay. Yeah. Now another point that you hit on, Billy, was this whole notion of due diligence. So what are some of the things that if I was looking to sell, like what would I be doing in order to prepare for due diligence? Sure. So on the on the sell side, um, depending on the size of the business and the complexity of the business, you can expect to have multiple due diligence streams come in. Um, a buyer is likely to have an insurance and benefits stream come through mm -hmm. and evalu evaluate your current that insurance and benefit structure and understand what that cost is and then what that cost would be to trans transform it to their structure. Mm -hmm. Does that represent incremental expense that they're going to have to pay or does it represent cost savings? So they'll, they'll do things of that nature. The best way to prepare is to have your corporate house in order okay. and be able to pull information readily and be able to give it to the other side when requested. Okay. So on the flip side, Lori, when I think of purchasing, what are some of the things that I would need to do in order to prepare my house, so to speak? Right. So it's very important that your acquisition strategy ideally be part of your corporate growth strategy so that all the business owners and principals are very clear about why you're doing an acquisition. Also, you want to be uh, characterizing your targets very specifically so that you know exactly what you're after. What's your budget for your acquisition and how do you plan to finance it? Is it um, corporate stock? Is it cash? Is it debt? Typically it's some or all of the above to spread the risk. And finally, don't fall in love with any targets. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you could be overlooking red flags that you need to take a closer look at. So in summary, uh, prepare and have your house in order ahead of time and remain objective. So, but how do you, let's unpack that a bit because it is a very, it's an emotional and a very expensive um, process or transaction. Right. Um, and so how do, you, how do you remain objective? Is it the people that you put around you or how do, how, what are some of the strategies to remain objective? Certainly having people around you that are experienced, but your uh, strategy should include success criteria with metrics so you can measure mm -hmm. how well each target um, fulfills those metrics and that helps you remain objective. And also having outside help consultants mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because they don't have a dog in the fight. Right. Okay. They can help you be more objective. And okay. I'd like to add to that too, you know, this is not only a financial consideration, it's a people consideration. Yeah, yeah. And so you have your key yes. people involved and they're gonna go through an emotional kind of uh, roller coaster, whether they say they are or they <laughs> say they're not. Mm -hmm. And so, and having it as a part of your um, standard plan, your operating plan is I'm going to grow through acquisition, mm -hmm. they're going to be aware that when we start pursuing a prospect, there's no need to get nervous. Mm -hmm. There's no need to now not share these emails that I'm, that I'm sending out. There's no need to change what we've been doing all along to be successful. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's also important to recognize, depending on the size of company, that you have to give them something um, to put at stake. So there's nothing wrong with considering retention bonuses so they don't exit when you exit right. uh, and making sure that the transition actually happens. Yeah. So let's yeah. talk about that for a minute mm -hmm. though because yeah, the people factor and having come up through corporate organizations where there were acquisitions and the anxiety and the oh, gossip, absolutely. the rumor mill and I would imagine that it's a much different level of anxiety if the employees know that oh, we're looking to acquire someone as opposed to we're being acquired. So how do we as small businesses, how do we address that successfully so that there isn't that anxiety level, so there isn't a mad exodus inside of our company? Yeah, again, it's, it's planning. And, and I go back to what, what Laurie said. It's planning and communication. Mm -hmm. So here's who we are. Here's how we're going to grow. We're going to have an acquisition every three years. And so that means every three years we're going to be looking for prospects. Mm -hmm. Now in the meanwhile, we may have people that want to pursue us. Mm -hmm. Um, and we want you to know that we're, we're interested in retaining you. This conversation is happening with your key employees, 
But your frontliners, you're just taking care of them the way you normally would. Okay. But your key employers need to be involved in the process. Okay. And, and, and the outside consultant comes in and gives them that, that detached, objective perspective. Mm -hmm. They've seen these transactions before. Yep. They, they can put, help put some of the key employees at ease. Okay. You were going to add something, Lauren? Yes. Um, for the company that's being acquired, those employees, over, over communication is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, as the deal closes and you're starting to integrate, that you get with those employees right away and help them understand their place in the new world order mm -hmm. and help them understand who their colleagues are, who they report to, what their job description is so that you don't have them either fly out the door or um, try to undermine the, the new order. Yeah, That's what, good point. One other thing I would say is from a sell side, if you are selling your company, you should, and you do care about your people and you care about the business on a go forward basis, you should do the best job you can to kind of keep their compensation and benefits aka the total package as similar mm -hmm. as it was under your regime. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that is often a key component of our deals um, when we're negotiating <coughs> on the sell side because it helps uh, keep your employees at ease to know that it's as close as it, it could be. It's, it's unlikely that everything will remain exactly the same, but <coughs> you want to try to minimize the change to uh, your employees through benefits and salary and all of that jazz. Okay. So in terms of trends that you all see, because I know recently it seems like I've seen a bunch of emails and I've talked to some of my colleagues and they're getting these unsolicited sort of requests for, oh, I want to buy your company. How do we determine, well actually, okay, Will, what makes a small business attractive to a buyer? And then as a small business receiving those unsolicited sort of emails, hey, we want to look, how do you know, how do you separate fact from fiction, truth from fiction in right. that scenario? Right, well, there's, there's, there's a two-part question there. So the first part is, what's attractive? Right. And, I, and historically, when you look at mainstream, main street businesses, what they've done is they've either brought themselves a job because they want to pursue something that they, they love. Mm -hmm. Could be baking, it could be uh, woodworking. They've created themselves a nice steady job where they control their schedule. When you scale up a bit, now you have income that you can actually walk away from. Mm -hmm. And so in understanding that, you have to uh, look at what's really attractive, and that is the profits. Okay. People are buying a, a, a revenue line, and so the, the, most, most, the most important thing I bring to my client's attention first is, so let's look at this in a, in a quick overview. What are the profits that we're trying to attain? Mm -hmm. Then you look into some of the other specifics. How are those profits arrived at? Okay. What's the customer count? What's the customer relationship like? What's the term of the agreements? How well is the agreement written? Mm -hmm. All of those things get dissected as a part of the due diligence. Okay. But I say day one, profit is the first thing that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. um, in some of the industries that are very popular right now, the tech world, culture is very important. But uh, as, a, as a business broker, I'm asking my clients to look at profit, number one. Okay. So then back to the unsolicited <coughs> question, though, because mm -hmm. these folks, when they email you, they have no idea because you're a small right. business, closely held. They don't know what your revenue might be, what your profit is. So what, what's that whole phenomena about? So um, if you're a seller and you receive an unsolicited bid, say you're not even trying to sell your company, mm -hmm. Um, buyers kind of come in two flavors. Mm -hmm. One is financial, the other strategic. So the financial buyers are looking for a fire sale. They'll buy distressed companies, um, either uh, they're having business problems or owners need to sell due to illness, divorce, or other personal circumstances. And um, they will come in uh, improve the company and turn it around within four to seven years versus a strategic buyer who's buying the company for its uh, products, for its customers, for its, the markets that it's in, mm -hmm. and they're likely to pay a higher price. So it's good to evaluate who you're dealing with mm -hmm. and then there are strategies to move on from there. 
Laurie brings up a good point. Uh, the fundraising that's occurred post the Great Recession is through the roof, and there is a lot of money on the sidelines right now, both from a strategic standpoint. Um, you know, your S I forget the exact number. I can look this up and get back to you to put it out. But the S&P 500 companies have, excluding banks, have extraordinarily, extraordinary amount of cash on the sidelines right now that they're, yeah. they're going to put to use. And then on top of that, you know, your private equity buyers, your financial buyers that Laurie mentioned, have raised, have raised significant, a significant amount of cash. So right now you have all this cash on the sideline. Growth is okay. It's you know it's going along. So a lot of people are chasing the inorganic growth, and they have a ton of cash on the side. Mm -hmm. So because of that, we're seeing valuations reach high levels. Interesting. And that's across all industries. And so what what do you um, expect that trend? Like how long do you expect that trend to last? Or what what can we expect like five ten years? From sure, now. sure. That's a that's an interesting question. No, <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if I could call the end of the end of the market cycle, I think I'd uh, I'd be retired on the beach by now. <laughs> but um, I I I'm still bullish. I think that we have a few more years left in this run. Um, there's just so much money on the sideline, mm. and people need to purchase growth. And for that reason, I think we'll continue to see M and A, and we'll see M and A at high valuations. Maybe the at some point, maybe the volume will pull back a mm -hmm. little bit, but I think the the highly sought after assets will continue to trade at high multiples. And adding on to that, you'll see companies going after smaller and smaller targets. Mm -hmm. They're moving down the chain of annual revenue companies in order to try to get ahead of the competition. Mm -hmm. And so they're buying not only smaller and smaller companies, but younger and younger companies too. Huh. Right. And, and to go back to the second part of that question, so if, if you get an unsolicited right. offer, you're going to let one of your partners kind of vet that offer. Mm -hmm. Even if you're not ready to sell, you may have your attorney or you may have your CPA, mm -hmm. or you may have your broker. Mm -hmm. Just investigate because the thing that you don't want is you don't want to fall into a time waster, right? And you don't want to fall into a situation where someone wants to do something, but they don't have the capital to do it. Yeah. I, yes. One, one other point here, and back to the financial buyers out there. So the a typical financial buyer um, has a team of associates that are that are working for them, and ultimately they're better off buying a company that does not have an advisor because mm -hmm. they they can come in and get a better deal. Oh, okay. So they are te mm -hmm. usually charged with making X calls a week to new companies, mm -hmm. or staying on top of targets, and trying to get them to take, you know, sell to them. Mm -hmm. uh, many, many, many times the deals that we work on start in that manner. Um, a, an example is uh, we sold a company that does um, pet food distribution up and down the East Coast. A private equity firm out of New York called and said, we'll pay you six and a half times EBITDA. Well, um, he called our group. We got engaged. He called the private equity firm back and said, I'd like to introduce you to my bankers. And immediately on that phone call, he went to seven times. Mm. So just mm. getting somebody engaged moved right. him up a half a turn in EBITDA. So ultimately, we ended up running a process. Mm -hmm. And that, um, that first private equity firm that lobbed in um, ended up not winning the business. The valuation shifted out into the right. So it's it's very important when when you do get an unsolicited offer. In my opinion, that you think has some legs to it, you test it out by bringing an advisor in. Absolutely. And trying yeah. to understand if it's real or if they're just kicking the tires. And if they are just if it's real, it's worth maybe running kind of a broader auction, not going to 3,000 people, but maybe you go to five of your most uh, logical buyers, put together an information packet, get out to them, see what, see where the market is, if there's any interest, and then, and then you have more than, you know, one dog in the race, or one horse in the race, and you can see um, from a valuation standpoint, and keep in mind, valuation isn't always the end-all, be-all. There could be uh, structural issues. There could be, you know, cultural issues. So sometimes, just because the guy offers the most money, doesn't mean it's the best deal. Out exactly. There. Yeah. Gotcha. Good point. 
Well, um, I want to offer the audience an opportunity to ask questions. So if you have a question, feel free to make your way to the microphone. I'll be first. Awesome. So from, good morning, my name is Tom Najar with Care Plus Home Health. Um, my question is for a small business, which most of us think are, can you guys talk about ways to purchase, uh, make an acquisition, meaning how would you form the deal? Up front, uh, over time, percentages, that sort of thing. Just, just some general information, thank you. Well, um, if I can take that question, most of our transactions in the uh, Main Street trade industries most of them involve some form of seller financing. And I, when I say most, I mean like greater than 60%. So the sellers involved in either A, I'm uh, holding the note with a substantial down payment, 20, 30%. B, I'm assisting with some of the settlement costs. Or C, we're agreeing on this price, but your, your payments, you're gonna get some at settlement, and you're going to have a payment schedule based on the transition plan and, and actually implementing that plan, which typically means the seller's around for 60 days to a few years. Um, so typically, that's the case. In the case where the buyer um, cannot have that opportunity, then we bring in someone uh, from m and <laughs> and And we try to engage uh, them to look at ways they can uh, finance the deal. And most of the time they're going to do a really great job in the due diligence and looking at whether their product is scalable or their service makes sense, what additional products and services can be added to the mix. Um, they do a real good job in creating different perspectives for the buyer to look at why I should go into debt to buy this business. Other questions? I'm Andrea Donathan of Donathan Consulting. We've spoken quite a bit about acquisitions. Um, I think there's a lot of situations where two sole proprietors or very small businesses might decide to merge mm -hmm. because they bring different strengths, they want to grow, this type of thing. Could you talk a bit about what the pros and cons are there and what to look out for? You want to take it? Laurie, you, you deal with sole proprietors more. If you want sure, to. I'm happy to take that on. So. Um, when you're integrating any two companies, whether they're small or big, you need to take a look at all aspects of the company because you're merging not only your people, but your systems, your data, your tools. So before you close on that deal, you're planning that integration. <coughs> and um, you're also estimating how many people it's going to take to do it, how long, how much and you go through and make decisions and prioritize which systems and data are going to be integrated first, second, third. And once the deal closes, you've got that plan and you go implement. And also, um, if you are thorough about your due diligence, you've identified some of the weaknesses and the risks that you need to watch out for. So it's common to underestimate the integration effort. Mm -hmm. So it's worthwhile to take the time to plan it well so yeah. it can go smoothly and you can realize the value that you're seeking for the acquisition in the first place. Yeah, I, I think uh, when you look at a, a merger, you also have characteristics of a partnership. So you want to slow down and speed up. Um, and you want to also make sure that there is some form of a buyout agreement because many times when a merger or, or a partnership occurs, there's not enough consideration given on the backside. Well, this has been done now, so I want to leave, or I want to leave prematurely. So that has to be a part of the, the conversation as well. Mm -hmm. Also, um, other governance issues come up in a, in a merger, meaning uh, sole proprietor A and sole proprietor B have been working and running their own shop. Now who's going to take over? Right. Who's gonna, who, who is taking the lead on department A, B, C, A, B and C? Who's going to run? the finance side of the world. So it's really, uh, in a merger of equals, it's, uh, governance really comes into, uh, into a big way. Not only um, like a buyout or buy-sell agreement down the road, but ultimately running the day-to-day. -day. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Some people have a hard time having to answer to somebody else with uh, 
you know, on a topic if they've been running their own shop for X years. Awesome point. Very good point. Yes. And on that note, this has been awesome. Thank you guys. We learned a ton. Thank you. Um, thank you for your insights. Um, thank you for joining us on the live stream as well as here in the television studio. This concludes this episode of the Small Business Network. We invite you back next month in August. We're going to have a lively discussion with the candidates for county executive here in Montgomery County around the topic of small business, economic development, and entrepreneurship. So thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.